So, I think I've made it clear in the past that I absolutely adore the Grand Theft Auto series. With my various tweets about the games and reviews on this channel, it's a game series that means so much to me and a series I treasure a lot. Some people may see it as a murdering or carjacking simulator, but it is so much more than that. The games bring players to these amazing locations and lets us do whatever we want. And most of the time it is stealing cars and murdering people, but it's fun, I promise. The sheer effort that goes into creating these games and incredible worlds is just amazing. The level of detail Rockstar adds is nothing to ignore. I will go as far as to say that the Grand Theft Auto series is not only the best open world series out there, but one of the best gaming franchises of all time. But every game series has to start off somewhere. The first three installments of the franchise were 2D top-down games. They weren't anything groundbreaking or incredible, but they were fun. Being able to roam around a fictional city and do whatever you want was so much fun for the time. But these games were held back by the limitations on the old hardware at the time. Like, these systems could barely run first-person shooters, let alone an entire open-world game. But at the beginning of the new millennium, newer consoles were released that were not only more advanced for the time, but could easily run big open worlds. But keep in mind that these consoles are like 20 years old, and that by today's standards are complete dog shit. Rockstar noticed the power of the PlayStation 2 and wanted to take advantage of the newer system. When Grand Theft Auto 2 released in 1999 to mediocre reception, they knew that the next installment of the series had to go above and beyond, attempt to create a game that seemed impossible for the time, but with a passionate team of game developers and some of the most talented writers and game producers of that time, they set out to create a game that was never attempted before. And this groundbreaking game was none other than Grand Theft Auto 3. Listen, you guys, you go inside while I talk to our new friend here. I see nothing but good things for you, my boy. Salvatore's death comes as pleasurable news. You're an efficient killer. I like that in a man. Cleaner. I'm proud of you, my boy. You kicked the shit out of those grease balls. Now, when it comes to Grand Theft Auto 3, it defined the open world game genre, and without it, not only would we not have the GTA series as it is today, but open world games would be very different. This game was, in many words, a game changer. It's set in stone what an open world game is. Now, at first glance, you may be like, Ew, what the fuck are these graphics? And you're right, this game has aged like rotten cheese, and compared to the more recent Grand Theft Auto games, it looks like dog shit. But listen, appearances aren't everything, just because it's aged badly does not change the fact on how revolutionary this game is. If anything, it shows how far the GTA series has come. Hell, one of the first videos on this channel was a review of this classic game. I enlisted this since it was pretty bad and has not aged well, but two years later, let's give it another go. Now in this video essay, I want to dive deep into this game, dissect it, and go into detail about what made it so groundbreaking and how it defined the open world game genre. But with every big game, it of course had a massive development where tons of changes were made. So first, let's look at the development and history and how Rockstar created such an outdated yet incredible game. So the development of Grand Theft Auto 3 started shortly after the release of Grand Theft Auto 2, which was released on the PlayStation 1 and Dreamcast console. Oh, 
Hey, remember the Dreamcast? GTA 2 was released to mixed reception, mainly due to how it was stuck down in the top-down view. Previously in June of 1990, Ubisoft Reflections released Driver. It was an open-world driving game that was sort of similar to GTA 2, only exception being that it was a 3D open-world game. You can drive around many different photorealistic worlds based on real-life locations. Now this game was a breakthrough for the console, and it received worldwide acclaim for how fun and amazing it was. And the sequel, Driver 2, expands on this concept by allowing the players to get out of their vehicles and roam around the cities. Now this was really pushing the PlayStation 1 to its limits, but it may have been a bit too ambitious? The controls in Driver 2 were very clunky and all over the place, so while it was way ahead of its time, gamers back then just didn't really get into the sequel all that much. Now Rockstar took a look at the Driver series and saw potential in creating a game that allowed players to roam around a 3D space. When GTA 2 was released, the PlayStation 2 was set to release the very next year. Now the PlayStation 2 was way more advanced than the PlayStation 1, but Rockstar wasn't actually planning to release a 3D GTA on the PlayStation 2. Instead, they pitched the idea of a 3D GTA to Microsoft, who were about to launch the up-and-coming Xbox. Sam Hauser, the president of Rockstar Games, told them the idea of a 3D open-world crime drama as an Xbox exclusive. Since at the time, the Xbox was way more powerful than the PlayStation 2, allowing for better graphics and bigger worlds. Xbox rejected the idea though, for unknown reasons, so Rockstar decided to go with the PlayStation 2. There were even plans to have Grand Theft Auto 3 released on the Sega Dreamcast, but the console was not powerful enough for the game that they had envisioned, and also no one owned a Dreamcast as well. So in August of 1999, development on Grand Theft Auto 3 would begin, with Rockstar North, formerly known as DMA Design in Edinburgh, Scotland, leading the production, and Rockstar Games over in New York looking over the development. Now the entire game took two years to create, which seems like nothing by today's standards, with games taking almost a decade to create nowadays. But back in the early days of gaming, games didn't take that long to make. Nowadays it's all about graphics and presentation, but back then it was all about creating a fun game. And this was the same case with Grand Theft Auto 3. Leslie Benzies, who led the development in Scotland, said that their goal was to recreate the freedom and diversity from the older games in a living, breathing 3D world, using the power of the PS2 to achieve their goals. They wanted to essentially create a world that felt alive, making the players feel like this world is real. One of the most difficult aspects of this game was creating the sounds and dialogue for the NPCs, as well as the radio dialogue. In most games at the time, characters would make grunts and groans and occasionally say something, but that's really it. But in this game, each character said something different, made different noises, and each location had sounds that were associated with it. Most of the dialogue and script was written by Dan Hauser, the former president of Rockstar Games, James Worrell, and Paul Kariski, with Laszlo Jones also helping out with the radio dialogue. According to Dan Hauser, there were over 8,000 to 18,000 lines of recorded dialogue used in the game, which was quite a lot for the time. The first year of development was mainly spent throwing ideas around the place and seeing what will work. Then in mid-2000, they finally started work on the technical side. They started to create the big world and test out some of the mechanics, like carjacking and the character designs. Originally, GTA 3 had a very cartoony style with its graphics. The game looked sort of similar to The Simpsons Hit and Run, and honestly, it doesn't look really good. Even for the time it was being worked on, it didn't look that good. But later on in December of 2000, they changed the graphics up a bit to have a more darker and grittier look to it, rather than a bright and colorful look. The main game engine that was used to create Grand Theft Auto 3 was Renderware. Now, Renderware was an extremely powerful game engine at the time, and it was able to help create games that, for the time, looked stunning in terms of graphics and scale. But another challenge that the developers faced was creating the open world. Most games at the time would let players walk around a restricted map, usually with invisible walls blocking the players from exploring further. With GTA 3, however, they wanted players to be able to explore as much of the map as possible. This proved to be very difficult, as the PS2 disc could only hold up to 32 megabytes of RAM, so they decided to stream the environment onto the CD into the game. What does that mean? I don't know, I'm not a game developer. When creating the world of GTA 3, they didn't want to base it off of any real-life locations, so instead, they reused Liberty City from GTA 1. Liberty City has three different islands and districts, the first one being Portland, an industrial district based on Brooklyn and Queens, Staten Island, a commercial district based on Manhattan, and Shoreside Vale, a suburban district based on New Jersey. Now, the primary inspiration for Liberty City is clearly New York. However, Dan Hauser described Liberty City as a hybrid of generic American cities, including Chicago, Pittsburgh, Detroit, New York, and Philadelphia, but it's clear they mainly took inspiration from New York. 
Their main goal when creating the world was to populate it with NPCs who seem believable. Vehicles that the player can hijack at any point, a day and night cycle, multiple weather types, and physics that felt and controlled in a realistic way. By late 2000, they had most of the map finished, the characters were walking around, and things were moving in a smooth direction. During E3 2001, Rockstar decided to show off a beta of Grand Theft Auto 3 for the first time. They set up everything and expected players to be blown away by the gameplay and open world design. However, players weren't really interested in the open world game. Instead, they shifted focus onto other Rockstar titles that are being shown off at E3. This really scared Rockstar, since they were worried that this game that they poured their blood, sweat, and tears into would end up being a failure. But it would later motivate them to go above and beyond and create something that would be a surefire hit. Later in September 2001, development was going along great, hype for the game was starting to build up, and it was looking to be a smash hit. But unfortunately, an event happened that no one saw coming, and it would later change not only the gaming industry, but the entire world as a whole. It's 8.52 here in New York. I'm Bryant Gumbel. We understand that there has been a plane crash on the uh, southern tip of Manhattan. You're looking at the uh, World Trade Center. We understand that a plane has crashed into the World Trade Center. We don't know anything. On September 11, 2001, a few weeks before Grand Theft Auto 3 was set to release, two planes struck the World Trade Center. Now this is a really sad and unfortunate event that ends up killing at least 3,000 people. Now you're probably wondering, how does this affect GTA 3? Well, when you think about it, GTA 3 is an action crime drama where you essentially play as a terrorist causing havoc around the streets of Liberty City. Plus, the location is very similar to New York. It also doesn't help that Rockstar's New York offices were located very close to Ground Zero. Sam and Dan Hauser even witnessed the attacks from their apartments. The Rockstar offices were closed for a few days due to road lockings. They couldn't even get any work done, but the programmers over in Scotland were able to continue working on the game. Sam and Dan Hauser thought about cancelling the game altogether, since they felt like it wasn't the right time to release a game this violent. When the offices opened back up, they had a meeting with Take-Two Interactive, the company that owns Rockstar, and Sony on what to do. They decided that instead of scrapping the game altogether, they would delay it by a few weeks and make some changes. Now, the changes that were made weren't massive. According to Dan Hauser, they only changed like 1% in the game. All they did was change the color of the police cars from blue to black. They removed a mission that made a reference to terrorism. They changed the direction of the planes in the sky and also made sure you can blow them up. And they changed the US box art to the now iconic panel style. By the way, I actually really liked like the original box art, but I can see why they changed the original cover. Thankfully, the game wasn't cancelled like the Housers had initially planned, and the game would eventually release on the 22nd of October 2001, exclusively for the PlayStation 2, later releasing on the Xbox and Windows computers. And as we all know it, it was a ginormous success. It sold over 14 million units and received praise for its groundbreaking open world design and gameplay elements. Sure, it did receive some controversy here and there, but let's not focus on that for now. Let's now properly dive deep into this game and see what made it so impressive yet amazing for the time. Now first things first, let's get into the story of Grand Theft Auto 3. In the game, you play as a silent protagonist named Claude. In the opening cutscene, we're seen robbing a bank with a woman named Catalina, who is Claude's girlfriend, and some Colombian guy. When they break out, Catalina soon betrays Claude, leaving him for dead. He lives, but is unfortunately arrested for robbing the bank, and is taken to prison. In the police escort, he's with a man named 8-Ball, who we'll get to know as the game continues, and a mysterious old man who we will also get to know later. While they are crossing the bridge, a few men from the cartel gang ambush them and take away the old man. Claude and 8-Ball are able to break out of the van, but the bridge is blown up, leaving them isolated on Portland. 8-Ball and Claude drive away, and they lay low in the red light district of Portland. 8-Ball then introduces Claude to Luigi Gotarelli, who offers Claude some work driving around Liberty City for him. After doing some jobs for Luigi, Claude meets up with Joey Leone, who is the son of Salvatore Leone, one of the biggest mobsters in all of Liberty City. After doing some more jobs for the Mafia, we get introduced to Salvatore Leone, who later introduces Claude to his wife, Maria, who starts to slowly take a liking to Claude. After both Claude and 8-Ball help blow up a cartel ship that was being run by Catalina, Salvatore is told that Maria and Claude are an item, and Salvatore decides to kill off Claude. Maria warns Claude just in time, and they both escape to Staten Island, with Maria's friend and Yakuza member, Asuka. When they arrive in Staten Island, Claude starts doing some work for Asuka, eventually becoming a member of the Yakuza gang, and gains the trust of Asuka's brother, Kenji. While doing some work for the Yakuza, Claude also does some work for Donald Love, who is sort of a parody on Donald Trump, and he is instructed to kill Kenji and make sure the Colombians are blamed for his death. Claude succeeds in killing Kenji and eventually runs into Catalina and a man named Miguel. 
Catalina escapes, but Miguel is left behind, where Asuka believes he's the one who murdered her brother. While doing more missions where you fight against the cartel, Catalina kidnaps Maria and murders both Miguel and Asuka. She demands over $500,000 in cash or Maria will be killed. Claude gathers the cash and meets her at Cedar Grove over in Shoreside Vale. Catalina attempts to kill Claude, but he escapes and chases her down. There is a massive shootout against Claude and the cartel, ending with Claude finally killing Catalina and saving Maria. Then he just kills Maria because she's really annoying. I broke a nail and my hair is ruined. I mean, can you believe it? This one cost me $50. Now that, that is Sigma male behavior. Now, the basic story and plot for the game is pretty basic, to be honest. Compared to later games like San Andreas and GTA 4, it isn't anything special. All that happens is Claude goes to someone, they give him a mission, he does the mission. It can honestly be somewhat repetitive, but at the same time, I sort of like it. Sure, the story is very basic and simple, but it has a nice charm to it. The main inspiration for the story are mobster movies and shows. Stuff like The Sopranos and Goodfellas really helped inspire the story here. Now, I would have liked it if the story had more depth to it. Like, the cutscenes can be pretty brief and go by very fast without telling us much about the characters. I wish we got longer cutscenes that told us more about the characters and story. We do get some cutscenes here and there that sort of give us clues on what's going on, but those cutscenes can be very brief, and like I said, most cutscenes here are mainly used to give us missions. It also doesn't help that the main character is completely silent. I'll get more into Claude when I start talking about the characters, but it's hard to identify or learn anything about Claude when he just stands around and does whatever people People tell him to do. Again, I'm not saying the story is terrible, since for the time, this was amazing. Stories in video games around this time were very basic and non-existent, only really having a character briefly tell us what to do. But here, they have big-named actors playing these characters, and motion capture cutscenes to make these characters feel more alive. But I wish we got to learn more about the characters and their backstories. In later games like Vice City and San Andreas, some characters from this game would actually return in those games, and it's nice that we get to see what their past was like and what their lives were like before the events of GTA 3. So while the story isn't amazing, for the time it was pretty ambitious. I do really like some of the characters present in the story, and the inspiration from Mafia movies is pretty obvious to notice, but it's kind of funny to be honest. The GTA series definitely had a long way to go in terms of storytelling, and they improved a lot as the series went on. So it's nice to see that their first attempt at telling a full story played out some okay. It could have been better, but for the time, it was pretty impressive. But in order for Rockstar to create an interesting story, they needed to create interesting characters that the players could relate to, and Liberty City is populated by many weird and strange characters that all make for fun interactions. First, let's start off with the main protagonist himself, Claude. Like I said earlier, Claude is a silent guy. He doesn't say a single word throughout the entire game. He might make a slight grunt when he gets injured, but that's really it. Honestly, as a character, Claude is pretty bare bones and basic. He just does what he is told to do and doesn't really show any emotions. The reason Claude was made as a silent protagonist was for two main reasons. Firstly, they were dealing with so much stuff throughout development, like creating a 3D open world and implementing unique sounds and music to the game. They simply just didn't have the time or even know how to implement a speaking protagonist into the game. And they felt that keeping the protagonist on mute would help players identify themselves as Claude, as in the players are experiencing all the madness around them. I guess a better way to explain it is that the players are Claude, if that makes sense, and they can imagine themselves as him. Claude wasn't even named Claude in GTA 3, only in GTA San Andreas, where he was finally given a name and some backstory. Hello Claude baby. I thought I called to say how much I love you and how well endowed you are. Nah, Catalina, it's Carl. I think you got the wrong number. Hey, what's up? <sighs> Hello? Yes, Claude! Faster, harder, deeper! Oh, yes! Yes, yes! <laughs> It's revealed in San Andreas that he started off as a street racer in San Fierro, where he first meets Catalina. He loses a race against the main protagonist of San Andreas, Carl C.J. Johnson. Him and Catalina would drive around America for the next few years, robbing several banks until arriving in Liberty City. Now, according to Rockstar, they had never planned to have Claude be a speaking protagonist. But recently, the GTA series channel obtained a copy of the GTA 3 design document, where it was revealed that Claude was supposed to have some lines. This was more than likely an idea they had way early in development, but decided not to go forward with it. There was also this early trailer for GTA 3, where Claude says, Get out of the car. This line was taken from GTA 2, so it was more than likely a placeholder. 
During development, Claude also had lots of beta designs and outfits that never made it into the final game. His final outfit in the game is a pair of green cargo pants and a black leather jacket, and I think it's the perfect design for him. It gives off the vibe of a small-time crook. His previous designs include a brown suit, a Hawaiian shirt, and various different hairstyles and tops before they landed on the final design. There's also another outfit Claude can wear in the game, a pair of blue jeans and a brown leather jacket. It's a slight edit from the final design, and it's only available on the PC version of the game. Either way, Claude is still a pretty decent character, I won't lie. As the series will continue, we will get introduced to much more deep and complex characters that I personally think are some of the greatest characters in all of gaming. So despite Claude being a mute and kind of bland and a bit generic, I do wish we got to learn more about him. He is silent, so we can't really gauge his personality, but for all we know, he is a silent badass and a killer who will murder anyone in his way to get what he wants. So he's not terrible, but he could have used a bit more development. But good old Claude isn't the only character in the game. There are so many characters here, all with different personalities and traits. And listing every character in the game would take ages. So I'm only gonna go over the main characters and the important ones. First, we got the main antagonist of the game, Catalina. I mentioned Catalina earlier and how she betrays Claude and leaves him for dead. And her presence in the game is pretty small, to be honest. She only appears in like three or four cutscenes, and that's about it. Sure, she is mentioned here and there, but sometimes I completely forgot that she was even in the game. It is pretty cool how Rockstar included a female antagonist in their first 3D GTA game, but I wish we got more from her. We barely learn anything about her, other than that she is kind of a crazy bitch and will kill anyone in her way. We do, however, learn more about her in San Andreas, where it's shown that she is batshit crazy and insane. Honestly, she was amazing in San Andreas, with how insane and crazy she was. What the f did you want? Nothing. I'm looking for a friend of mine's cousin. Come on. Make God. He ain't here. You? But Cesar said you was a real man. Crazy. I'm a god fearing peace-loving man of the people. Whatever, asshole. Let's go. Damn, relax, baby. Look, baby, I really need that paper. Oh my god! What in hell's name is that? This, you fucking prick! This is a rack! I'm gonna no, torture babe, your sorry no, ass! Please, no! You never write to me! You don't call! You treat me like a fucking whore! I wish you saw more of this kind of personality in GTA 3, but all in all, she's a decent antagonist. She gives Claude a reason for him to rise up the ranks in Liberty City, and like I said earlier, it is pretty cool seeing a female antagonist that is actually dangerous and poses a threat. Plus, I'll admit, her voice acting is really solid. The real question is, did you turn up to rescue Maria or to get me back? Well, I got news for you. Shooting you will be a pleasure, but dating you was only business. You are muy pequeñito, amigo. In terms of other main characters, we have Maria. She is the wife of Salvatore Leone and is sort of the main love interest of Claude. She appears in a good few cutscenes and does make a big impact on the plot. She is the main reason we have to run away to Staten Island, and she's also the reason we have a confrontation with Catalina at the end. And she can be somewhat funny. Like, there are some lines from Maria that did make me laugh, but other times I thought she was really annoying. Like, she meets Claude for a few hours, he doesn't say a word, then she claims they are a couple without even telling him. Like, Huh? I couldn't let him do that. I mean, the worst thing is, it's all my fault because I told him we were an item. Don't ask me why. I don't know. Then we got Asuka. We get introduced to her through Maria when we escape from Portland. She's the main leader of the Yakuza clan and is honestly really cool. It's great to see a female protagonist in these old games that actually have some power and isn't just some bland love interest. Well, it is sort of implied that she wants to fuck Claude, but she's probably just quirky or some shit like that. And honestly, those are the only sort of main characters in the game. Other characters like Salvatore, Luigi, Joey, Tony, Raymond, and Donald Love only really give you a few missions around the beginning of the game, and that's it. There is 8-Ball who you escape with in the beginning of the game, and you do like one mission with him, but that's about it to be honest. I guess there was the corrupt police officer, Ray. He was decent, I guess. I liked some of his missions, and I thought he was pretty funny. We saw action in Nicaragua back when the country knew what it was doing. I'd go myself, but the old sciatic is playing up. <laughs> so, uh, good luck. There's also Donald Love, who I actually found to be quite interesting. And fun fact, he's actually played by the same voice actor who voiced Riley's dad in Inside Out. Isn't that amazing? He was kind of interesting in the game, I guess, but he gets way more development in the prequel game, GTA Liberty City Stories. And honestly, he has so much character and personality to him in that game, and I just love it. I'm at one with the universe, that's just impossible. Oh, 
Shit, that's right. Um, there is a load of Colombians coming up here to potentially kill me if I don't keep my mouth shut and pay them all off. But all the other characters here are mainly used to give you missions. It's a real shame we didn't get to see more of them in this game, since they could have been really good. What really sucks though, is that there are some really talented actors in this game, like Frank Vincent, Michael Madison, Joe Pantaleone, Michael Rapport, and many more great voice actors. Plus, some of the designs of the characters are, uh... Uh... uh maybe we should start talking about the graphics and design of the game, should we? Yeah, let's talk about the graphics and design for a minute. So, yeah, these graphics have really not held up all that well. At first glance, they look really, really bad. Now, in all fairness, the graphics aren't that terrible, I'd say. They are simply a product of their time. Like, come on, the graphics aren't the worst. If you were to simply get the gameplay footage, put it in a 4x3 aspect ratio, lower the resolution a bit, and add a TV static effect, it looks like Red Dead Redemption 2 now. Okay, in all seriousness, I know that these graphics have not aged that well, but for the time, they were kind of impressive. Back then, they were clearly going for a somewhat realistic design approach to the humans, but 20 years later, they look really blocky and messy. But one thing I appreciate about the graphics are actually the character animations. The movements were done using motion capture, and while they are a bit messy, I appreciate how ambitious they were for the time. If you look at old video game cutscenes from the time, they are also stiff and boring to look at, characters just standing in one place telling you what to do. But look at these character animations, look how expressive they are just with their body movements. Sure, it doesn't look amazing and it's a bit blocky, but it's so much better than characters just standing around in one place. The only issue was that these motion capture cutscenes were so difficult and complicated to do. So they tried their best to work around these limitations, whether the character would leave a note for the player to read, they call you on the phone, or it's just Claude and another character talking to each other. But they do try to implement multiple characters into cutscenes, but sometimes these cutscenes can just look really silly. Like this scene where Claude punches a cartel member. Like, bro, what was that? Oh my god, bro. Oh, hell no, man. What the fuck? And the hands and fingers are just all over the place. They look like spades for some reason and nothing like actual hands. Although one thing I can genuinely praise the graphics for is the design of Liberty City. They went for a grey and sort of green color palette when designing the look for Liberty City. They purposely made the city look really bleak and ugly, which I honestly really like and helps bring the city to life. Most games nowadays try to make the games look super clean and shiny, which, while it can look good, can also be very distracting most of the time. But here, they made the entire design ugly and grim, which I think is really cool. Even the lighting system for this game is really impressive for the time, implementing shadows to really bring this game to life. Sure, the later GTA games would have better graphics and animations, but I can't help but admire how far they went to make this game look as ugly as possible. But let's get into easily the biggest aspect of GTA 3, and what many people consider to be the main protagonist of the game, Liberty City. Now looking at the map at a first glance, it looks pretty small, but for the time, this was considered to be a huge map. And that's thanks to how detailed and how well designed the city is. Like I brought up earlier, there are three main islands that make up Liberty City. Portland, Staten Island, and Shoreside Vale. In the beginning of the game, you start off in Portland, this part of the map is really dark and grimy, and also very dangerous. The entire island feels like a rundown and sketchy place where you wouldn't want to end up in. And I think starting off in Portland was a fantastic idea. Starting off the story in a really shitty industrial part of Liberty City really gives off the vibe of being a small time crook with barely any money, and doing some odd jobs around the place just to make a small bit of cash. And I just love the design of this area. It sort of reminds me of Dublin City on a good day. Then the next part of the city is Staten Island. This is the more commercial area of Liberty City, with tall skyscrapers and businessmen doing their typical 9 to 5 jobs. This part of the map is definitely less shitty than Portland, but it is still pretty shitty. During the day, it feels like a somewhat safe and nice place to live, but during the night, it is a complete shithole. But when you actually advance to Staten Island, you feel like you're climbing up the criminal ladder. In Portland, you have to sleep in a shitty little warehouse, and the entire atmosphere of Portland is just really, really depressing. But in Staten Island, you actually get a full apartment, and instead of working for small-time mobsters, you start working for people who are higher up in the food chain, and the entire vibe of this island is definitely a lot more clean, but they still kept a dangerous feel to it. I love driving around Staten Island and doing all these missions and getting in trouble with the police. Then the final island of the game is Shoreside Vale. Shoreside Vale is meant to be the more suburban part of Liberty City, and honestly, I didn't really care for this part of the map. 
For one, there is no real reason to go here. The only mission you can do here is the final mission, where you kill off Catalina. And the entire map is sort of a mess. The roads go all over the place, and it's super confusing to drive around, especially with no map. The only point of interest in Shoreside Vale is Francis International Airport. You can't fly the planes, unfortunately, except for the Dodo, which is near impossible to fly, since the wings are clipped off. Other than that, there is no real point to go to this part of the map. I guess it's somewhat fun to get into a police chase, but it's nothing really special I guess. It's just kind of… there. All in all, the entire map is really good. I love that despite how small the map is, it feels so much bigger, thanks to how detailed and unique each and every street of the city is. While I do personally think that GTA 4's rendition of Liberty City is better, I still find this rendition of Liberty City to be so charming and amazing, despite how much of a shithole it is. But it's time to get into the most important part of any game, the aspect that usually defines whether a game is good or not, and that is the gameplay. The gameplay here does seem pretty simple at first. You drive around the map, steal cars, kill people, rinse and repeat, right? But let's look at the gameplay in more detail, shall we? Like I said before, this game was one of the first open world games ever, so they had nothing to base this off of. I guess there was Super Mario 64 back in 1996, but there were loads of limitations with that game. Like, loads of limitations. Here, however, it is a fully open world where the players can explore and do whatever they want. To keep players wanting to come back to this game and stop them from getting bored, the developers added a plethora of story missions and side missions. And I mean a lot of side missions. First of all, there are the main story missions, of course, where after you complete a certain amount of story missions, you unlock the next island. Pretty basic and simple, right? Then there are the payphone missions, which are pretty basic. You talk to someone on the phone and do a mission for them. Kinda standard, you know? Then there are the vigilante missions, where you can be a taxi driver, police driver, ambulance driver, and a firefighter. But if you don't like following the law, you can do the rampage missions, where you have to kill a certain amount of criminals in a certain amount of time. You can do some unique stunts with vehicles and earn some cash. You can do the import-export missions, where you have to steal a certain vehicle and bring it to a garage. You can even control a tiny RC car and blow up other cars. There's even some street racing you can do on the side, and there are hidden packages all throughout Liberty City, and you have to try and find every last one of them. And saving the best for last, you can have sex with prostitutes. Holy fuck, I'm coming! Oh yeah. Wow, that was a lot of side content, wasn't it? And beating all this side content can sometimes be fun, but it can also be a fucking nightmare sometimes. And this unfortunately falls into the biggest problem with GTA 3, the outdated controls and gameplay mechanics. Now this part of the video will sort of be a rant on how broken the mechanics and controls are, but keep in mind I still do like this game, but holy shit! First of all, the controls in this game are, well, broken. Now this could be because this game is ancient and running on a Windows 10 computer is near impossible. So how can I play this game in a working condition? You play the game as it was originally intended to be played. Yes, I actually got a copy of Grand Theft Auto 3 on the PlayStation 2 and I actually got a PlayStation 2 with a controller and I dug out my old TV from like 15 years ago. This all cost me 100 euros, at least. What the fuck am I doing in my life? Anyway, let's go and play this game as it was originally intended to be played. On the PlayStation 2, an old piece of shit TV. Yay. Sorry if I look kind of uh, ugly right now. I just woke up and I'm um, kind of hungover, so my bad. Anyway, let's pop this fucker in, shall we? I don't even know if this will fucking work. Uh, I, hope it, I hope this actually works, because I don't know if this will work or not. I'm pretty sure, like, I, I, I tested it like two days ago and it kind of worked. Will you just fucking work, please? Holy shit. It says AV2 back there, so let's move to AV2. Oh, there we are. It's on, never mind. Is this how long it took for games to load back in the day? Should I remember playing on the Wii? Oh, never mind, it's loaded now. Rockstar Games. That's a cool intro, to be fair. That's a really fucking go. Do you, oh, this is like DMA renderware platform. This wasn't on the PC version. The text is different as well, it's on like, up in the left corner. A DMA design- it's DMA design production. I'm, I'm guessing like the, like, P- like, that's, the, this is like an old version obviously. What version is this actually? Does it say on here? Alright. Wood smash. Damn. Why are you so angry? Why can't he just be happy, you know? You know, these graphics, like, you know, when you put on kind of a small TV and 
lower the resolution a bit and add TV static, it's not bad. It's like, they look, I, I can imagine from the time people were really impressed. God, these controls are like, not the best, but like, you know, terrible. You know, I actually kind of like the lighting here. Holy crap. This is definitely way better than the PC version. Oh shit, I cannot play, uh, I cannot play music because YouTube's gonna fuck me in the ass. Unless YouTube, like, I don't know, changes their fucking policy and allows creators to play music, which will never happen. That would be cool, though. That would be very cool. The ro the roads have, like, that kind of reflection. Like, I don't know if you can see that, but, like, there's this weird, ref like, weird reflection on the road, and it's actually... It looks really good. It's like the rain reflect, like the lights are reflecting onto the road. That's fucking cool. I know this is kind of a gameplay video at the moment, but I promise I'll get back into the retrospective type shit later on. But shit, if you like, if you move this, you kind of get into a first person mode. That's very awkward, actually. Yes. Drive Misty for me. Who the fuck's Misty, bro? Who names their bleeding daughter Misty? I don't care. He's like, clocks like, what, 30? Don't call him kid. Call him man. Like, how you doing, man? Remember, this is your foot in the door. I mean, is Misty even that good looking? I can't imagine she's, like, all that good. I give Misty, like, I don't know, let's pick up Misty first and see what we're dealing with right now. You know, the graphics really aren't that bad. Like, when you get an old, like, PS2 game and you put it into 4K, the graphics, like, kind of show their blockiness, but, like, when they're kind of low resolution and low quality, they're really not that bad. Like, I wouldn't say they're amazing, but, like, you know, I could, I would def, if I first played this, like, back in fucking, I don't know, whenever this game came out, uh, 1951, I would have been blown away. Is that Misty? Is that, is that Misty? Yeah, uh... Yeah, no, nah, I'm sorry, Misty. Um, yeah, I'll take you to Joey. You can, you can be with Joey then. Oh, it's just like a normal New York guy. Hey, yo, come back later. There might be some work for you. What kind of work, Joey? Like, you need to tell me what kind of work I'm doing before I actually do the fucking work. Because, like, I don't want to just be, you know, working for you and not know what I'm doing. Like, I don't know what thing about cars. Yeah, so far this is going pretty well. I just realized this basically turned into a gameplay video, so I'm probably just gonna stop here by, I don't know, killing this, um, killing this guy right here. I said killing this guy right here. I said, ki yeah, die, die, yeah, die, die. Anyway, enough of real life me being a complete doofus on camera. Let's go back to the retrospective video and hopefully it's going well. Okay, so let's say you don't have a PS2, or an old TV, and a copy of GTA 3. How do you play this game in a working condition? Well, you could purchase the Steam version, then install a bunch of mods to make this game run... somewhat decently? I would personally go with the Xbox mod, since it upscales the graphics, and kind of fixes the controls, but even then, this game is still fucking impossible, man. First of all, Everything in this game can kill you. The police here are fucking savages, and they will not rest until you are dead. And the enemy's AI must be set to a thousand, since they are ruthless in killing you. A great example of this is later on in the game, when after you kill Salvatore Leone, you basically become wanted by the Portland Mafia. So if you set foot near his house, or the St. Mark's Bistro, or anywhere in Portland, you are fucking dead. And in Staten Island, the cartels are crazy, and you'll have 10 of them at once trying to kill you. Now, despite how annoying and painful this can be, it does add a level of excitement to this game. Like, you always gotta be prepared and carry weapons on you at all time. And it can be pretty fun getting into full-blown wars with the enemy gangs. Like I said, just be prepared for an attack at any point. But if I had to talk about the most stressful and annoying part of this game, it has to be the timer missions. Some missions here will give you a certain amount of time to do a job, and they can be so fucking annoying. So let's say you're doing a mission, you're making good progress, then all of a sudden you die. You spawn at the nearest hospital, you have to get your weapons back, drive all the way back to the mission startup point, and star again. And good luck even finishing the missions on time, because most of these time-based missions require you to drive all around the map and navigate the city without a map. 
One of these missions, Expresso to Go, is a great example of how painful some of these missions can be. In this mission, you have less than 8 minutes to drive around all the islands and blow up the coffee stands. And sometimes they stir up just don't show you where the stands are. So you're basically left driving around the islands trying to find these stands. And make sure you don't die, because you will have to start from the beginning. And it's fucking torture! <sighs> Fuck, I'm going a bit mad, aren't I? Fuck. Now, despite my little tantrum there, I do somewhat enjoy the challenge. I wouldn't say the missions are unplayable. They are just really, 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 really hard. But after some time, you will eventually beat them. Plus, some of the missions can be exciting. Again, keep in mind I said some of them, because the game design and level layout here has aged extremely poorly, and trying to beat some of these missions and dying over and over and over and over again gets pretty frustrating. You could use cheat codes, I guess, but that's for babies. Real men don't use cheat codes around here. So yeah, while I do find the missions to be pretty annoying, I really do appreciate how much stuff they put into this game for us to enjoy. But what would be the main gameplay aspect of this game? Some people say that the storyline is the main aspect of the game, but real hardcore gamers like me know that the main aspect here is causing havoc. Doing the story missions and side activities is fun, don't get me wrong. But at the same time, stealing a car and just going crazy around the city is just so much fun. Plus, we get a variety of weapons that we can use to kill anyone in our path. You slowly earn more dangerous and advanced weapons as the game goes on. In the beginning of the game, you start off with something small, like a pistol. But later on in the game, you can get a fucking rocket launcher. Hell, if you try hard enough, you can hijack a fucking tank and basically become invincible. Now, if you're a normie and don't like causing mayhem all over Liberty City, you can try to play the game by following the traffic signals and not killing anyone, which would be near impossible because following the traffic rules is fucking boring. I want to drive on the footpath, run over anyone in my way, and listen to the Scarface soundtrack. Plus, in order to advance in the game, you kind of have to kill people, but at least when you're in the vehicles, you you can listen to some banging music. Uh, that, that was my poor attempt at a segue into the music segment of the video, so uh, yeah, here's the music segment of the video. Now, music is really important for a great gaming experience. Games like Mario Galaxy, Undertale, or even Sonic Adventure have phenomenal soundtracks that help elevate those games into god status. Basically, every game needs to have a memorable soundtrack. And oh boy, the soundtrack to GTA 3 is just mwah. Beautiful, I tell ya. First, there's the intro music to the game, which in my opinion, is one of the most iconic gaming theme songs of all time. It sort of feels like the intro to a Mafia movie, and it really gets players excited to play the game. The piano in the opening, the violins coming in, and the music slowly building up is just amazing. But that's kind of it when it comes to original music created for the game. There are some original music tracks here and there, and I guess there's the ending music, but there's nothing really else that was created for the actual game. Everything else is actually licensed music and songs that play on the radio stations. There's a total of 8 radio stations in GTA 3. We got Head Radio, Double Clef FM, KJR Radio, Rise FM, Lips 106, Game Radio, MXX FM, Chatterbox FM, and Flashback 96.6. All these stations have their own unique personalities to them, thanks to the amazing dialogue written by Dan Hauser and Laszlo Jones. And they each play their own genre of music, whether that be opera music, rock and roll, or reg re reggae, re reggae, re reg wow, I'm so fucking white, re re reggae, yeah, re reggae music. I think my two favorite stations to listen to had to be Flashback 96.6 and Chatterbox FM. I like these stations because, well, first of all, Flashback just literally plays the Scarface soundtrack, which is one of my favorite movies of all time, by the way. And it has a phenomenal soundtrack, so I'm always listening to Flashback FM. Rush, rush, get the yeah, yeah, I can't play this song because YouTube's gonna fuck me over, but you get the idea. I also love the host, and how she seems to be mentally stuck in the 1980s with how often she brings up the past. Oh, 1983. I played the trumpet a lot back then, if you know what I mean. I wonder what happened to Marcel. Every night at all the clubs. God, that one night. Was it Marcel? Or was it Mary? Oh, sorry. I'm having one of those flashback, flashback, flashbacks. Chatterbox FM doesn't actually play music, and it's mainly just a talk show station. But god damn, this radio show is fucking hilarious. 
Firstly, Laszlo Jones voices the main host, and he is so funny with his really remarks, and just his entire personality. Plus, they bring out some crazy colors, and some of these colors seem so crazy and weird that I can definitely imagine this kind of stuff happening on American talk shows. I think my favorite color from the show is when Dan Hauser makes a cameo as this British color who talks about having a nanny, and j just listen to it for yourself, it's comedy gold. Alright, hello, you are on Chatterbox. Hello, Laszlo, I'm a first-time caller. I recently moved to Liberty City from Hampshire in England. Oh, really? How do you like it? I mean, is it hard to get used to the language? You, you speak English pretty good. Oh, thank you, Laszlo. Yes, yes, I, I do like it here. There's one thing, though, that, that's very different and rather worrying. When I was a boy in England, I had a nanny. She was very strict, Laszlo. Yeah, well, I mean, there's excellent child care here in America, you know. Well, well I'm sure. But the, but the thing is, Laszlo, when, when, when I was a naughty boy, I, 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 I would get spanked. Na nanny, Nanny would spank me when I was naughty, and now, now Freddy needs a nanny because when Freddy's naughty, he needs to get spanked. Well, there's some child psychologists who probably say that spanking can be harmful to a child's emotional development. Ab ab absolute rot, Laszlo. It's lovely. Freddy needs a nanny. He needs a nanny, Laszlo, because Freddy's been a very naughty boy. H how old is your son? Excuse me? How old is your son? I don't have children. I can't stand the little brats. But Freddy needs a nut. All right, that's enough of him. God, who gave this guy a green card? This is Chatterbox. We're talking about short guys, nannies, taxes, and anything sane you'd like to bring to the party. All right, hello. Next caller, you're on Chatterbox. Hello, Laszlo. Ugh. Did that woman say she was a nanny? Because Freddy needs a nanny because he's been a very naughty boy. No, no nannies. Everything about the game so far, aside from the controls and level design, has been really positive. Sure, it's a bit outdated and broken, but this game was incredible for the time, and it's hard to believe that people hated this game, right? Right? Well, I wanted to save the best segment for last, as I think it's time we talk about the controversy that this game got. Get ready, this will be an interesting segment. Hey, I'm really sorry to do this guys, but this is a bit of a trigger warning. In the following segment, I'm going to be discussing some real life murders and crimes and just kind of lots of not really fun stuff. So if you don't want to hear any of that or even see any of that, then skip to this timestamp in the video. Uh, let's go on. July 10th. 2002. This is the nation's top selling video game. The object? Kill as many people as you can, get as many stars at each you can. And millions of kids are mastering it by learning to slaughter bystanders. It's as close as you can get to like killing someone without like being arrested or really killing someone. Now, before Grand Theft Auto 3 was even released, people were already going on about how violent and awful this game is, claiming that a game where you basically can go around murdering people will cause kids to want to commit crimes. The controversy only got worse after the game was released. Parents and politicians did not like this game in the slightest, mainly due to how realistic the game was for the time. There are plenty of violent video games on the market today, but what sets Grand Theft Auto 3 apart is the game's stunning realism. Yeah, GTA 3 is realistic. Yeah, sure thing, Karen. Basically, in 2001, every kid wanted this game because nothing like it had ever been made before. Imagine you're a kid in the early 2000s and you love to play video games with a burning passion. Then you hear about a game where there are basically no limitations, you can steal cars at any point, roam around a ginormous city, and basically cause havoc and do whatever you want. And like I said, for the time, these graphics and gameplay mechanics were revolutionary. So it does sort of make sense why younger kids would want to get their hands on this game. But parents did not want their children playing this game at all, because apparently it glorifies violence. And let me tell you, some people would not stop going after this game. There were online articles made, news segments that were dedicated to this game, and even certain murders and crimes were linked to this game. Now, was all this controversy warranted? Well, no, not really. In fact, a lot of the controversy here is pretty stupid in my opinion. 
Now allow me to explain my reasoning. Firstly, we kind of need to address the elephant in the room and acknowledge that this game was rated M for Mature, meaning that kids cannot buy this game, and the only way they can get their hands on this game is if their parents buy it for them. You see the issue here and where I'm coming from? This game was not made for children, and was made for a more older audience. So if parents don't want their children to play this game, then maybe they shouldn't get it for them? Just a little suggestion though. Like, I do somewhat understand how people can be upset over the violence, like that's completely fair. But maybe, instead of attacking the people who made this game, you should just be a good parent and not allow your children to play this game? There are so many cases out there of how young children, and even some adults, were motivated to commit crimes thanks to this game. Now these kind of stories often involve crimes such as stealing cars or even murdering people, which is not a laughing matter in the slightest. But I think it's a bit unfair to blame Rockstar on the crimes committed by these people. While the game is really violent, it never directly tells the players to go outside and kill people or even steal shit. Most of the time, these people commit these crimes on their own terms. Plus, the game would never force the player to murder innocent NPCs, and if you start committing crimes in the game, the police will try and stop you and arrest you. So while I do kind of see how people can get angry at this game, personally I think it's a bit unfair to put all the blame on Rockstar. Like I said, the game is rated M for Mature, so parents need to be cautious of what games they get their children. But I don't really want to dive too deep into all the controversies, since it's really complicated, especially with later installments of the game, since the controversies just get worse and worse. Anyway, enough of all this controversy crap, let's get back into the actual game itself. So after the game was released and it became a huge hit, what happened next? Well, as we all know, Rockstar would go on to release many more GTA titles like Vice City, San Andreas, GTA 4, and 5, but this is a video on GTA 3, so did anything happen to the game after its release? Well, in May of 2002, there was a port made for the Windows PC computer, and this port was received relatively well, I'm not gonna lie. It's basically the same game as the PS2 version, although with slightly different controls and the graphics are a bit more pixelated. Although there were plans to implement a first person mode into the PC ports, but Rockstar didn't do anything with this idea. I'm guessing because it was too complicated for the time, who knows. Then a whopping two years later in October of 2003, the game was released for the original Xbox. And this time, the game had improved graphics and textures, and it looks pretty damn good I won't lie. Like look at good old Cloud over here, instead of having a blank and emotionless face, he's got an angry expression on his face. Isn't that pretty cool? And generally, this game runs a lot better than the PlayStation 2 version. There was also a prequel game made that was based on the events of GTA 3, called Grand Theft Auto Liberty City Stories, which was released in 2004 on the PSP, and later on the PlayStation 2. This game takes place three years before the events of GTA 3, and instead of playing as Claude, you play as Tony Cipriani. R remember Tony Cipriani? That one fat guy who gave you missions? Yeah, yeah, he's the main character now, him, yeah, he, he, he's the main character. I do plan on making a separate video on this game sometime in the future, but what are my brief opinions on this game? I mean, it's alright, like... It's definitely a big improvement from GTA 3, but compared to San Andreas, which was released in the same year, it's alright, I guess. Then on the 10th anniversary of this game, Rockstar released GTA 3 on mobile devices under the name Grand Theft Auto 3 The Anniversary Edition, and somehow they managed to fit the whole entire game onto mobile devices in 2011, which is actually pretty damn impressive. They essentially ported the Xbox version of the game and made the graphics much more clean. Now, while it is pretty impressive they got the whole game to work on mobile devices, the controls are abysmal and super difficult to work with. And the game can be pretty buggy from time to time. But give them credit, they were able to port this game onto mobile devices, and that alone is pretty cool. Then... We got the 20th Anniversary Edition. I got a little job for you, pal. Oh! Ew! Dude! What the fuck? Yeah, this game blows. So, to celebrate the 20th anniversary of this game, Rockstar decided to not only remaster GTA 3, but Vice City and San Andreas into one big game called the GTA Trilogy The Definitive Edition. Now, I have already made a video discussing my issues with this game, but to make things short and brief, GTA 3 is completely ruined here. The game runs like shit, the character models look abysmal, except for Claude, he looks alright. And despite the new graphics and lighting system looking somewhat nice, it just doesn't look like GTA 3. Liberty City is supposed to be dark and gloomy, but now it's all bright and shiny and I just... Ugh, I fucking hate this game! 
Anyway, now it's time to get to the conclusion part of this video, where we finally wrap things up and talk about the legacy of this outdated, yet phenomenal game. Also, I'm so fucking glad we're finally finishing up this video, because making an hour-long video on a 21-year-old game is not fucking easy, and I'm just so tired, there was so much editing and audio and writing to do, and I just... Ugh, oh, I'm never doing this again, man. Fuck me, let's just get to the conclusion already. So, I think a good way to wrap up this video is to ask the question, is this game any good? Well, it's by no means a bad game. If anything, I would consider it to be a groundbreaking masterpiece, but I wouldn't say it's flawless. There are so many elements of this game that have aged really poorly and can be frustrating by today's standards. But what exactly could you really expect from a 20-year-old game that was the first of its kind? Games that were really impressive years ago tend to show their flaws once technology improves. Like, look at the old Atari games, for example. Sure, by today's standards, it would be hard to even classify these as games, since the graphics are just a bunch of colored squares, and the gameplay can be incredibly simple. But when these games were first released way back in the 70s, no one had seen anything like them before. People back then thought that gaming had reached its height and couldn't get better than Space Invaders or the E.T. game on Atari. But as time goes on, technology becomes more and more advanced, allowing for creative game makers to push themselves to the limit, and create something that could entertain people for years to come. And I think the same can be said about Grand Theft Auto 3. All Rockstar had at the time was an idea, and some insanely talented individuals who wanted to make something amazing. And despite how the game may look today, you can't deny that this game was a breakthrough. Even to this day, I am still blown away with what they were able to achieve with this game. Of course, Rockstar would perfect the open world game genre, with many more future game installments that would be amazing and groundbreaking. And yeah, if I were to judge all the GTA games today, GTA 3 would definitely be one of the weakest. But it was the first, and it began a whole legacy of incredible games that so many people love and enjoy playing to this day. Hell, even looking at the game as it is now, it is still pretty damn fun to play. It's sort of like playing an old N64 game. They may not hold up well, but they can be super fun to play. So, all in all, this game is a flawed, but fun masterpiece. And if you disagree with me... You're... Ah! Ah! I'm joking, of course. I'll never do anything like that to my subscribers. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching. As you can tell from the really long runtime, this was a topic I am super passionate about. So I hope you all enjoyed this. And you bet that I will make big ass retrospectives like this on the later GTA games. Anyway, I hope you all had an amazing day. And I'll see you guys in the next video. See ya.